Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today I would like to tell you about string diagrams. String diagrams. So you move a little bit away from adjoint functors, take a short break about algebra and just draw diagrams. So string diagrams, one of the most powerful concepts category theory has ever born. It's really, really cute. It's amazing. Um, you probably can't see immediately that it's really useful. We'll see that in later videos. But for now, I just need it at the moment um, because I would like to give a different motivation of adjoint functors and it will play a crucial role in this different motivation of adjoint functors. So the first was kind of the algebraic motivation. Adjoint functors are generalizing equivalences and then there will be a diagrammatic motivation. But in order to uh, explain the diagrammatic motivation, I need to explain a little bit what diagrammatic algebra is. So this kind of uh, marks the birth of diagrammatic algebra, at least on this channel, of course, uh, the birth of diagrammatic algebra lies pretty much a long time in the past. I will elaborate on this a little bit more, but for now, let's just go with it and let's just see how we can actually draw categories in a different way than we are used to in a different way. And in some sense, in a better way. In some sense, of course, not in a better way, but in some pretty precise sense uh, that you will see later if you have more structures on the categories. It's a really cool way of drawing categories. It's called string diagrams, categories and related stuff. And it's the following idea. I will draw pictures here. And it's kind of fun. So a category I will draw as a face. So I will have a picture and there will be a face and there will be a category. So the, the, every face will represent a category. Right? Uh, usually, because I'm really lazy, I just draw them as rectangles, as filled rectangles, uh, but actually I could draw any face in the end. Mm, but let's go with rectangles for now. So a category itself is a face of a diagram I would like to draw. A functor is, so this is a two-dimensional thing, a two-dimensional object. A functor will be a one-dimensional object. The natural transformation will be a zero-dimensional object. What is a one-dimensional object? It's a line. So I will draw a functor as a line. So a functor from C to D, kind of a little bit weirdish that the standard reading convention here, or at least the one I'm using, uh, goes uh, from right to left. Um, so from C to D, so this functor jumps from C to D. And you can see it in the picture because you need to cross the line, you need to cross the border uh, in order to go from C to D. And that's a functor. A functor is not just a line, right? The category is a face, a functor is a line. And what could be now a natural transformation? Well, a natural transformation from F to G. So here's my F and here's my G is, well, I would should write just a point, but the point's a little bit hard to see on slides. So instead of writing a point, I write this little coupon, uh, which is then labeled with uh, the natural transformation I have in mind. So everything is kind of labeled. You have faces labeled with categories, you have lines labeled with functors, and you have coupons or points, strictly speaking, labeled with natural transformation, okay? And you might say now, okay, that's just a funny notation, but the point is now you can just explain what a category is, or in this case, actually a two category. I haven't said that, we don't know two categories yet, but anyway, um, by just explaining the natural operations on, on all of these in pictures. So you can, for example, compose functors, uh, we'll do that in a second, um, or compose natural transformations in two ways. So you can compose functors uh, and it's done by just stacking pictures. So here you have a functor from uh, F and H. So F, um, let's say goes from C to D and H goes from D to E. And the composition is just stacking the diagrams in this direction, just next to one another, right? They will meet in a common face and you can just stack them next to one another. Here's maybe a little easier to see F and H you stack them together. Similarly for the functors I call G and I, you stack them together. And now you also get a, a very easy way to stack together natural transformations by just, well, going with the picture. Just take the picture, they enter the common face, you see it in the color here, boop, you just merge common, common faces, you just merge the colors, you get a new picture. Okay, and you can do the same in the other direction because we are playing a two-dimensional game, right? So if you have a picture like this and it ends in G and you have another picture like this and it ends in G, then you can just glue G's together and you get a new picture, right? Which is just collapse in a slightly easier picture. So you have two operations, a vertical and a horizontal stacking uh, or whatever you want to call it, which come up naturally because we have a two dimensional picture. 
and it decodes everything. So horizontally is composition of functors plus the horizontal composition of natural transformations. You can compose natural transformations in two ways. And the other operation on natural transformations is vertically. It, that's kind of now pretty obvious why you can uh, compose natural transformations in two ways. Because if you have those diagrams, think of them as like Lego bricks. There will be exactly one way, or there, there might be two ways to stick them together. And these are the two natural operations in the plane. So actually, category theory looks like something that is really two-dimensional here. This is kind of a really beautiful picture, right? So category theory is actually doing uh, two-dimensional algebra. It's kind of cool uh, as a thought, actually. And it turns out to be pretty true, um, which we won't see today anymore, but in later videos, we'll see, actually, this is really powerful calculus. Just let me mention, so where's our classical calculus? Um, a classical calculus is Poincaré dual to the one I just showed you. So in classical, we would draw um, categories as vertices of a graph. Uh, we would draw factors as the edges of the graph and natural transformations like this one here. It's kind of the face of the graph. And this just turns everything around, keeping in mind that this is a right to true left reading and this is a left to right reading. Otherwise, it's really just the same. So here's face A. It goes to here and you just can't see what I've just done because I decided to draw green over green which is pretty brilliant. But anyway, so uh, A goes to here and it's now a face and the functors, so here's the functor and here's the functor, uh, K and F and so on. So it's just a Poincaré dual picture. So in string diagrams, categories are faces, functors are lines and natural transformations are coupons. So it's kind of a Poincaré, and not just kind of, it is the Poincaré dual to the classical picture. And it turns out to be a little bit more intuitive from the set of operations, for example, here, you can you can stick those together in a topological way as well. But um, this is kind of pretty obvious, for example, why you have two compositions for natural transformations. So formally, um, I don't want to write down what a, what a formal string diagram is, but basically you have objects represented by portions of a plane, arrows represented by strings, natural transformations represented by coupons, and the evident, the obvious composition rules given by stacking pictures whenever that makes sense. And it's kind of the start of what I would call diagrammatic algebra. So diagrammatic algebra is the aim is to really formalize diagrammatic reasoning in a really, really precise sense, okay? So you can make this really precise, formalize and mechanicalize diagrammatic reasoning. And we'll see that for the adjoint functors in the later video. And then I will do many more of those uh, diagrammatic calculations. With, with like everything, with arithmetic, it takes you a while until you are convinced that arithmetic is actually something useful. And it might also take a while until you are convinced that diagrammatic reasoning is something really useful diagrammatic algebra. But kind of the point is really that I want something like this for categories. So here is a proof, which I won't explain because that's the whole point of this diagrammatic proof that I don't need to explain it. So have a look at the proof. Uh, I hope you are convinced that the statement this proof makes is true uh, because the proof I think is, is really good. It is a really good proof. Uh, this is a really, really good proof. It's very enlightening, much more enlightening than at least for me, uh, than the algebraic way of doing it. And that's the point of string diagrams. That's where we want to go with string diagrams in the end. We want to go to a the stage where we can rigorously prove statements in a diagrammatic, kind of visually obvious way. And we will try to do that in later videos. For now, let's just go uh, with the diagrammatics. And I want to like to wrap up the video to try to convince you that this is not Oh, the super new and fancy mathematics, but it's actually a pretty nice and old idea. And it took a really long time to become more in standard mathematics, like, like, like everything might take a long, long time. Um, I'm not quite sure who was the first one who did this form of diagrammatics. It's a little bit hard to gauge. Of course, people have drawn diagrams for ages, but uh, if it really was diagrammatic algebra in the strict sense of we have some calculus and we stick pictures together, less clear to me. Let's just say, I would like to start with Gauss in, in this um, in this little slide about history. Uh, it's a little bit hard to gauge, but uh, there's some, a lot of Gauss's handwritten notes and Gauss managed to write down or already thought about 
as a string diagrams, as you can see here, um, for the experts, they were thinking about braids and kind of how braids arise, so sort of a braiding number, the linking number, and how they arise in electromagnetism. That's a while ago. That was really a while ago. And it took a long time until people did something similar. It's not, it's not a super easy idea. So yeah, list some of the instances. Probably the most famous one is a, the kind of the one they want to date it back to is Penrose's Tensor Calculus, which is by now still uh, quite old. It's from 1972. Um, you might remember if you're, it's not your first video you watch on category theory on this channel, that I tend to like to play with this one cop category. And it's actually stolen from a from an old work of uh, Richard Brauer from a, quite a while ago, from the 30s of the last century. Um, so I stole that. And it was kind of impressive that Brauer came up with it because um, it was the time, so in the 1930s, the categories were not known in the 1930s, but it's still kind of a natural object. Uh, anyway, this slide is just to give you some historical background on diagrammatics. And in the end, what we want is we're going to want to uh, kind of formalize diagrammatic reasoning that you can just say, uh, okay, here's a complicated statement. Here's a nice proof. I don't have to explain anything anymore. And done. It, obviously, it's not as easy if you have a slightly more complicated statement uh, than this one here. But subject similar is actually true. And the first, uh, the first instance where we will use it will be to kind of motivate adjoint functors from a really, really different point of view than the one I already gave in a previous video. Anyway, so that's about string diagrammatics for now. Just remember, categories are two-dimensional, functors are one-dimensional, and natural transformations are zero-dimensional, and whole of category theory is, in some sense, a two-dimensional version of arithmetic, if you want, or of algebra, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope to see you next time.